last class we talked about what it meant for a group, a Galois group, to be solvable. And we said, oh, we're going to take this idea of solvable and make it something that applies to any groups. So here's our definition. A group is solvable if and only if we can find a chain of subgroups that's finite that has these properties. So each subgroup is normal in the next, and their quotients are all abelian. The quotient groups would get our abelian, and the very last subgroup in our finite chain should just be the identity. So if we take some of the stuff we did last chapter, what we're saying is that if our Galois group satisfies hypotheses S, that means that our Galois group is a solvable group. And so to show that something is not a solvable polynomial equation, we're going to show that the Galois group is not solvable. And so what we're going to need to do is come up with a way of showing that groups aren't solvable. And that's where this word up at the top of the page, commutator, comes in. We're going to investigate these things called commutators as a way of looking at whether or not subgroups are normal. Before we do that, there are a few little useful facts. So first of all, um, the identity subgroup is always a normal subgroup. And that's easy to see. You can see the proof right there. And every abelian group is solvable. That's because in an abelian group, every subgroup is normal. And so we can just take the group G and the subgroup, the identity, and that's our finite chain. We have G, and then we have the identity subgroup is normal in G. And that's our whole finite chain for solvability. So those are a few good starting points for us. So let's do an example. In the notes, we've got this example that says that S3 is a solvable group. And remember that S3 is the set of permutations of three things. So we've got the identity, we've got our transpositions that permute two things, so 1, 2, 1, 3, and 2, 3. And then we've got the 2, 3 cycles, 1, 2, 3, and 1, 3, 2. Now, if S3 were an abelian group, we'd be done by the previous proposition, but we know that S3 is not abelian, that we've got elements that don't commute with each other. But we did show that there's a normal subgroup, and we're calling it H1 in here. So our normal subgroup consists of the identity permutation and then both of our three cycles. And the claim is that if we take the chain S3, so that's H0, and then that has n, which we're calling h1 in it. And then we take the identity subgroup. That this will give us a chain where every subgroup is normal in the next, and all of our quotients are abelian, so that we have an abelian, so that we have a solvable group, so that S3 is solvable. So we, I think, have already showed that H1 is normal, but this little direct computation piece shows us that as well. Another way to show this that I prefer to what's in the notes is just to check that um, sigma H equals H sigma for all sigma in S3, which is saying the left and right cosets are the same. But here's where we get to use some counting in a nice way. So if I know that, oh, and this is H1. My bad. If we know that H1 has three elements and S3 has six elements, then there are only two cosets to begin with, either on the left or the right. One of them is going to be H, and the other one has all the other group elements. So whether or not we're working with left cosets or right cosets, we get the same two cosets, H and the other one. So that tells us that H1 is normal in S3. Another way of saying this is that the index of h1 and s3 is 2, which means that left and right cosets are going to have to be the same. So we, know all, so we know that h1 is normal in s3. We know that the identity subgroup is normal in h1. And now we look at the quotients of these things. When we take s3 mod h1, we get two elements, and 2 is a prime. So Cauchy's theorem says that this is abelian. I don't know if we've talked about Cauchy's theorem. But it's kind of nice. It tells you if you have a, a group of prime order, then it's got to be abelian. And then again, H1 itself has three elements in it, so it's abelian. And then if we mod out by the identity, we just get 
H3, H1 back, so it's still abelian. And so therefore, we have a solvable group. So life is pretty good in S3. And that means that if we take any polynomial of degree 3 and we look at its Galois group, its Galois group is going to be a subgroup of S3. And subgroups of solvable groups are also solvable. So this is pretty nice. We know that we're going to end up getting that we have a, um, a cubic formula because S3 is a solvable group. So one more time, let's take stock of where we are in the class. If P of X is solvable by radicals, then our Galois group that we get, the associated Galois group, will be solvable. If the Galois group is not solvable, that means that our original polynomial is not solvable by radicals. So we need to show that our Galois group, we need to find a Galois group that's not a solvable group to show that the polynomial we started with is not solvable by radicals. And we use commutators to do this. So the idea of a commutator is down here in the middle of the page. The commutator of x and y is an element that we make by multiplying x, y, and their inverses together. So the commutator of x, y, and sometimes you see this with bracket notation, so x, y brackets, is going to be x inverse, y inverse, x, y. And we're going to use these commutators to figure out what happens with our solvable groups. Now just take a second and notice that if we do the commutator yx, we're going to get y inverse x inverse yx, and those are a sa the same if and only if x and y commute with one another, and you can check that out for yourself. So um, the way that we use these commutators is up above in Proposition 26.4. So if I have a normal subgroup of g, and I want to check that g mod n is abelian, I can make sure that the subgroup generated by all the commutators of elements in G belongs to the subgroup N. So this is how we use commutators. We use commutators to check if something is abelian. I don't think abelianness is a word, but I'm going to say it anyway. So when we're doing those quotients, if we don't get something of prime order, we can't just magically use Cauchy's theorem to say, oh, it's abelian. But we could check that the commutator subgroup, the stuff generated by all the commutators in G, is an element, is, belong is a subset of our normal subgroup. So the commutator subgroup is generated by all the commutators of G. And so with our S notation, we just take S of the set of commutators, so x inverse y inverse xy for all x, y, and g. And it turns out that inverses of commutators are also commutators. So really, this commutator subgroup, which we call g prime, is just the product of commutators, which may, may or may not be commutators themselves. So then we could take all of the commutators of commutators and get G double prime, or G2, and that would be the second commutator subgroup. We could do G triple prime, the commutators of commutators of commutators, and so on. And so we use what looks like derivative notation to keep track of which commutator subgroup we're talking about. So G to the parentheses I is like G I prime, right? Like we're taking the derivative of the I, of the I minus first derivative. So if we look at the proposition we proved on the previous page, we're just saying that g mod n is abelian if and only if the first commutator subgroup is a subgroup of the normal subgroup n. And we can prove that if g is an abelian group, our commutator subgroup is just the identity, and that's not that hard. If we have an abelian group, then x, y, and their inverses all commute with each other, and we can shuffle things around until we get the identity. So in an abelian group, we get that eventually, or actually right away, our commutator subgroup is the identity. And so you can think of commutator subgroups as measuring how far away we are from being abelian. If the first commutator subgroup is the identity, then we're abelian right off the bat. Maybe the second commutator subgroup is abelian. That says we're not abelian right away, but we're not that far off. There's only a few things that don't actually commute with each other. So the big picture 
uh, with commutators, even beyond our course, is that commutator subgroups measure how close you are to having an abelian group in your hands. And if we look at the next example and find the first commutator subgroup of S3, you can see that we have to do a little bit of work to get it, but the second commutator subgroup of S3 down here is the identity. So S3 isn't abelian, but it's kind of close to being abelian. And I'll let you work through the details of this example. It's one that's better to work through privately and then ask questions about than to just listen to me blather on about. But as always, if you have questions about this example, you can put them on Piazza. So we want to use these commutator subgroups to figure out how to show that something isn't solvable. And that's going to be our, that's going to be kind of like the crowning piece of theory that we need. And then all we need to do is find a polynomial. So the proposition that's going to be really useful to us is that the ith commutator subgroup of a group G is a normal subgroup of G for every I. And there's a proof over here that uses a lemma um, that says that the commutator subgroups of any subgroup of a group G are normal in G. And so we can use that to show that all of the ith commutator subgroups are normal subgroups of G. And there's kind of a cute trick that's used in here where if you've got something like um, an element like that, you can sneak in little products of G inverse and G between other elements, and those are just the identity in a creative way. So this is another piece of our course where we see using the identity in a creative way as part of our algebra toolkit. So here are the major pieces that we need to tee up to finish up what we've got going on. First is that G is a solvable group if and only if eventually one of its commutator subgroups is the identity. And the gist of the proof is that if we know that the commutator subgroups live inside of the uh, inside of normal subgroups and solvable groups need to eventually get down to the identity in these normal subgroups then there's no way to keep sneaking in these commutator subgroups unless they are eventually the identity and that's the idea that you'll see in the sketch of this proof here so G is a solvable group if and only if there's a positive integer n where the nth commutator subgroup of G is the identity. And that finally gives us a way to determine whether or not a group is solvable. Because if we can show that its, sol its commutator subgroups are never the identity, that means that our group can't be solvable. So G n not equal the identity for any n tells us that the group G is not solvable. And that's what we've been looking for. We've been looking for a way to argue that a group is not solvable so that if it happens to be a Galois group, we can say that our original polynomial is not solvable by radicals. So we're pretty close. So what we want to do is we want to show that S5 is not solvable. And so what we're going to do is show that the commutator subgroups of S5 never give us the identity. And the way that we do that is by showing that all of the three cycles belong to all of the commutator subgroups. That is, whenever we take nth commutator subgroups, then we're going to have all possible three cycles in Sn, and that's for any n greater than or equal to 5. So as long as n is greater than or equal to 5, we get all of the three cycles. And this is a really cool proof. I'm going to do a separate video on the proof of this as an example of how to show something like this with cycles. But you can see here that 
what we need to make this work, the reason that we need n to be greater than or equal to 5 is we need a, at most one overlapping element between these two things. So here we've got 1, 2, 3, and 1, 4, 5 belong to S5, and we're going to show that when we take any other 3 cycle, we're going to be able to write it as a commutator of 1, 2, 3, and 1, 4, 5. And we do that by defining this permutation, sigma, that sends 1 to A, 3 to B, and 4 to 5. And that's because the commutator of 1, 2, 3, and 1, 4, 5 is the permutation 1, 3, 5. And now if we do this commutator, or if we take the conjugate by sigma of 1, 3, 5, we get that that permutation goes to B takes A to B and B to C and C to A, and anything else just gets stuck wherever it is. So all the other things are fixed. And here we're using that our commutator subgroups are normal in the, in the group that they're the commutator subgroup for. So that means what this tells us about Sn to the fifth, or sorry, S5 to the n, where we're taking the nth commutator subgroup, is that it's never going to be the identity. And that's it. That's the punchline. We've got that Sn is not a solvable group if n is at least 5. And so now the very last piece of this puzzle is find p of x in q bracket x, where the Galois group is isomorphic to S5. And then we've got that its Galois group is not solvable, and therefore P of X is not solvable by radicals.